it was unplugged. Test, 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 thank you.
That was beautiful. Thank you very much. It's one of those songs I go, wait, I know that song in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was great. Uh, good morning, buenos dias, and welcome, bienvenido, um, and happy St. Valentine's Day. I don't know how to say that in Spanish, and also happy St. Gertrude's Day, the patron saint of tats. Uh, so, yeah. what did I say? Oh, <laughs> I don't know how to say it in English then. <laughs> St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> uh, but good morning. Glad to have you all here. A uh, couple quick announcements. Just note in the back of the, uh, on the um, calendar on the back, we've changed the nomenclature from Bible studies to spiritual growth classes. Because we're just, they're, they're not just Bible studies, but they're about spiritual growth. So just be mindful of that. Uh, also too, I have been informed that it is time for you to place your orders for Easter lilies. Easter is just coming up. Uh, we have one more week until Holy Week arrives next Palm Sunday. Jim will be preaching, uh, and then Holy Week will begin uh, with a Monday-Thursday service, and then on Easter we'll have a sunrise service uh, at 7 a.m. out here on the labyrinth. Uh, might have, have, actually have some coffee and donuts after that, and then an Easter service. Our Easter egg hunt is coming up in two weeks. It'll be on the 30th on Holy Saturday, the day before Easter at 10 a.m. sharp. So if you have any friends or neighbors you wanna invite, please do. Um, we're still collecting candy and eggs, we're still in need of some Easter candy. It's kind of expensive this year, so I really appreciate your, your donations if you can help out. And my confusion as to what Saints Day it is explains why <laughs> I'm wearing pink instead of green. No. <laughs> Please stand as you are able for our call to worship, which is found in your bulletin and on the screen. Linton travelers, how long have you traveled this road with your gaze pointed down at the dust and gravel and asphalt as you walk or limp or roll down the path? Sometimes it's easier to look at the road than at the people who share the journey with us. Lift up your heads, look, Listen, reach out a hand. Who are your neighbors on this road? We lift our heads and look to our Savior who journeys with us and helps us notice our neighbors all around us. This is the Lenten journey, to learn to love God and love our neighbors just as Jesus showed us. Our journey teaches us to lose our lives to God as we find and follow Christ in our service to others. Come, let us worship God who caravans with us on this road to the cross. Come, Come let, let us, us worship. worship. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Most gracious and holy God, we thank you so much that we can draw near to you during this season of Lent. Lord God, I pray that you would continue to inspire us, continue to lead us uh, on this path as we journey towards Holy Week and towards Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Bless us all during this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And if you would stay standing and join me for the opening hymn, it is a mighty fortress is our God, number 110, and we're going to be singing verses 1, 2, and 4.
each to each the same, and he must win the battle. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts of sorrows through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. truth abideth still his kingdom is forever and would the children please come forward for the children's message today Good morning, everybody. How are you? So very nice to see you today, ladies. Gwen, in your beautiful dress. Everybody wearing green? Oh, yep. Everybody has a little bit of green on. All right. So I'm going to pretend for a second, OK? Top of the morning to you kids. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Have you found any four-leaf clovers out there? Anyone bring some potatoes for lunch? How about corned beef? Have you met me sheep here? She's just been doing some grazing. Shall we gather around for a bit of harp music? Anyone got a harp? Okay, well obviously, I'm not from Ireland and I don't do accents very well. But did you know, St. Patrick was not actually from Ireland. Did you know that? He was actually British by birth. He was captured and taken to Ireland to work as a slave, basically a prisoner. And while he was there, he worked as a shepherd, hence the sheep, because Ireland has a lot of sheep. That gave him plenty of time to think about God and pray. Well, St. Patrick, the good story is, he eventually managed to escape from slavery, and he moved back home to England. However... Once he got there, he felt that God was calling him back to Ireland to serve the people there and tell them about Jesus. So, again, he left his first home and went back to the land where he was in captivity. And do you know what he did then? He brought them God's message of forgiveness in Christ. He didn't have to go back there to do that, did he? Yeah, he's kind of crazy for doing that, I think. But... He was responsible for bringing Christianity to Ireland because he knew that God cared about the Celtic people just as much as he loved anyone else. And it's interesting because in today's gospel reading, um, Jesus is expressing his sorrow over Jerusalem because Jerusalem was supposed to be a very special and a very holy place for God's chosen people. But when Jesus came, Nobody recognized him. They didn't know who he was. And Jesus was a little upset that they rejected him. But he promised a blessing for those who would accept him. You see, Jesus came for everyone who would receive him. He wasn't really at home on earth, but he knew that God's presence was everywhere in the Holy Spirit. Patrick also discovered that God could be present everywhere, whether he was at home, he was at home or in a different home, right? Not at home. So have you ever had to move to a new place? I know you have. You haven't ever had to move to a new place? No? Never had to move to a new house? Well, I know when I first moved here, 
it was really hard because all of my friends and my family and my grandparents and cousins, they lived in Michigan, which is really, really far away. And I was really lonely. I didn't know that many friends. And I had to adjust to living in a new, strange place. But you know what? It wasn't that bad because I knew that God was with me no matter where I went. No matter where I moved, God was always going to be there with me. And eventually, and hopefully, I would make new friends, right? And maybe I could tell those new friends about Jesus. Maybe my friends had never heard of that, of him before. So because we know these things, because we know that God goes with us no matter where we go, we can be comforted and ready to share the hope of Christ with everyone we meet, just like St. Patrick did. How do we do that? How do we do that? How do we tell people about Jesus? Or how do we show God's love to other people? Do we use kind words? Mm -hmm. what, um, what about our actions? Those are kind of more important than words sometimes because our actions demonstrate the love of God through our attitude, right? Yeah. And the simple gestures, maybe a smile, that's kind. And it can go a long way to communicate that we care about somebody else, right? So let's practice that this week. Whenever you come across somebody, smile or say hello. Have a good day. Jesus loves you. Right? That's pretty easy. So I have a coloring sheet for you today. It's talking about God being three in one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's a special coloring page for St. Patrick's Day. So I'm going to ask Corinne to take those back to the coloring table. And now we, it is time to pray. Let us pray. Dear God, Thank you for being present with us. Help us to remember that you are near, no matter where we go. Help us to be bold to share the love of Christ with one another. Thank you for your love, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our ushers will come forward this time to receive our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. Most gracious and holy God, you are indeed our creator, sustainer, and redeemer. All that we have comes from you. Bless this which we give back to you to be used for the building of your kingdom. Grant us the wisdom to use these gifts well. Bless those who give and those who receive. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
<coughs> Excuse me. Want me the third be the third person to say Happy Patty's Day. And also I've been told that in the Deep South, the correct salutation is Aaron Gobra. All y'all. With, of course, an Irish accent. Uh, I'm here to bring you the scripture reading this morning, and that's from Psalm 51, verses 1 through 12. And the title is Prayer for Cleansing and Pardon. Hear now the word of God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire in the inward being, therefore teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with high sop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my inequities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. This is the word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. We come now in our service to a time where we have the opportunity to go to the Lord in prayer. And as we always do, I ask that you take your burdens and the problems of your life and leave them here. Leave them at the feet of God, for God will take care of them. So with all of that, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving God, in all things, Lord, we give you thanks. Spring is upon us, and there is a, a newness everywhere. Lord, may we take the opportunity, if only for a brief moment, to just look around and enjoy the beauty that you have created for us. May we glory in it, and may we give thanks that you have allowed us to be a part of it. So in this time of spring and in this time of newness, Lord, may we find a, a fresh and a new heart to be able to see your beauty, to be able to feel your presence, to experience the great love that you have for each and every one of us. You know, Lord, sometimes we take all of this, all of these things, and we take them for granted. But you have provided for us all that we need, all that we need. May we take the opportunity to enjoy the beauty that you've created for us. May we take time to experience the love that you show to each and every one of us, that great love. Gracious God, may we also during this time find ways to, to share that love, the love that you have so, so graciously poured out to us. May we take the opportunity to share it with others, that they too may experience what it means to be a part of your kingdom. May we take the opportunity, Lord, wherever it presents itself, to serve to help others that may not be as fortunate as us. May those opportunities as they are put before us be an opportunity for us to show your great love. Lord, may we take the opportunity wherever it presents itself to spread the good news 
the good news of your son Jesus and what that good news means not only for us individually but for us collectively thank you Lord in all things thank you today Lord we gather and we bring to you our prayer concerns those on our prayer list those that may not have been spoken or mentioned today that rest heavy upon the heart we ask that you be with each and every one of them may they too feel the newness the freshness of this new season and where there is need for healing Lord may you provide that healing for those that may be grieving this day Lord give them peace and comfort the peace and comfort that only you are able to do and for those that are hurting this day Lord may you take away the pain may they too feel your love your grace and your mercy and Lord sometimes we we don't necessarily lift up those that are lonely but those that are lonely this day may they feel your holy presence and may they know may they know that they are not alone for you are with them always and every step of the way we pray for those that hunger this day those that hunger for your love may they find it may they find you loving God the giver of all light and life you sent Jesus into this world not to condemn the world but to save it help us to lift up the light of Christ this day so that the world might believe in him and receive the gift of eternal life through Christ the light of the world and today Lord we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us so long ago as we say our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
And all God's people said, Amen. If you like old hymns and singing old hymns, you need to join us when we go to Atria Senior Living on uh, the second, tu second Tuesday of the month at 2.30 because we sing a lot of old hymns. And it's a lot of fun, and you can come join us and uh, engage in these old hymns. I know they really appreci appreciate it when we come there. They often say this is their only church service that we provide for them. And so know that you're welcome to attend that at any time. Today's sermon is titled, Enough is Never Enough. Let us pray. Most gracious and holy God, thank you for rest. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your love. Be with us now. May the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be acceptable unto you. And may your spirit alight afresh upon us and lead us into acts of love on behalf of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have you ever reached your limits? Have, have you ever found yourself waiting for a doctor, or waiting in line at a store, or waiting on traffic that is ground to a halt? Never. Not here in Atlanta? Traffic ground to a halt? Never. And suddenly, you lose it. You go bonkers. You exclaim, either verbally or silently, enough is enough. And you start thinking of a way to escape the situation. Or, have you ever been working on a relationship or with someone you love? And no matter how much time you give, no matter how much slack you cut them, no matter how many times you forgive them and forget, no, no matter how many times you start over, that relationship or person simply remains stuck where they are. And suddenly you lose it. You go bonkers. You exclaim either verbally or silently, enough is enough and you start thinking of a way to end that relationship or turn it over to a professional? Or have you ever found yourself part of a group of well-meaning people who are working together on some sort of project or who are all trying to fulfill some sort of vision or mission? And no matter the compromises, no matter the badgering, no matter the reasoning and the logic used in hopes of motivating them, are bringing them together in a united front, nothing seems to work. And suddenly, you lose it. You go bonkers. And you either exclaim verbally or silently, enough is enough. And you start thinking of a way to remove yourself from that group or simply to disband the group. Now, do any of these situations resonate with you? Yeah, I think they do. They certainly do with me. Sometimes, no matter how much energy, love, and commitment, and work you put into something or someone, things simply just fall apart and never come together. And all you want to do is throw up your hands and scream, enough is enough, and just walk away. I know this fits me and many of us all to a T sometimes. However, I am exceedingly glad that our God has never said, enough is enough. But instead, he has always said, enough is never enough. Which brings us to our reading for today, which today is taken from the Old Testament, so you don't need to stand up. It's from the prophet Jeremiah, uh, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. This is called the New Covenant. Please hear these words. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. This passage that I just read from Jeremiah opens with the prophet telling us that God will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah, which begs the question, why does God need to make a new covenant with Israel? Well, the answer is simple. The people of Israel broke the old covenant, which was the covenant that God had established with them through the laws of Moses. But if that old covenant was conditional, as it is, if then, if it was a conditional covenant, if in that, if the people of Israel, they would be blessed and live if they kept the law, but would be cursed and die if they broke the law, if that is the case, and since it's obvious that they broke the law, why doesn't God just throw up his hands and exclaim, enough is enough? and turn his back on them and walk away. Why is that? Why is it that God does not do something most of us would do? Well, once again, the reason is simple. God loves us. And when it comes to saving us, God will never say, enough is enough. But instead, God will always say, enough is never enough. No matter how many times we drop the ball, God will not give up on us. Instead, God will go back to the drawing board and try to find a new way to save us. In fact, this is not the first time God made a new covenant to replace an old covenant that no longer seemed to work for the people of Israel. God has done this repeatedly throughout the Bible. In fact, one might consider the Bible as a history of these covenants that God made with the people. First, a lot of people wonder if Adam and Eve is a covenant, but technically it's not, even though some people say it's a covenant. But covenant in Hebrew means barit, which means to cut. And back in the day of Adam and Eve, they didn't eat animals, so they had nothing to cut. Anyway, point being, the first covenant is actually with Noah, called the Noahic covenant, right? And this is with all the people. After the flood came and God destroyed the earth, because at that time, God said enough is enough. At least seemed to say that. But then he started making covenants with us all. And after that, that never happened again. So he made a covenant not to destroy the earth again by a flood or all the people. And the sign of that covenant was, as we all know, the rainbow. And then along came Abraham. And God made a new covenant with Abraham called the Abrahamic covenant uh, with Abraham and all of his descendants. And he promised them that he would lead them to the promised land and make a great nation of them and bless those who bless them and curse those who curse them. And of course, the sign of the covenant for this was circumcision. Okay, a few centuries go by, and suddenly God makes a new covenant with the people of Israel, the Mosaic covenant, right, with our man Moses. He makes Israel his treasured people, a kingdom of priests, uh, and a holy nation. This covenant is conditional, however. If you keep my covenant, I will bless you. If you disobey and break my covenant, I will curse you. And the sign of this covenant was what? The law. And then, a few centuries later, God makes a new covenant with us again. Okay? Called the Davidic covenant. This is with the royal kingdom covenant with David and his dynasty, that they would rule Israel forever. And God would raise up from David's line a Messiah who would lead his people out of oppression. And the sign of this, of course, was the throne or the dynasty, the house of David. Lots of covenants God made with us throughout the centuries. One covenant after another covenant. And finally, here in Jeremiah, we have what's called the new covenant. And God will write that law on our hearts. And all people will know that God is their God and that they are God's people. And the sign of this is that they will know who the Lord is. It is this final covenant, the so-called new covenant, that we Christians consider fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Right? What all this makes clear is that God loves us and will do all in his power to save us. For God is not for for for, for God it is not good enough to do to just do good. Let me just read that Sometimes you have to just read these out loud. For God, it is not good enough to do just enough. Right? God will always do more than enough. 
God will always go the extra mile for our well-being. The question I have for us based on this history of God, if God never says enough is enough, is how far are we willing to go for God? When is enough enough for us on behalf of God and the church? How often uh, have we said, I've heard, I have said, or whatever, how often have we heard, I've given enough to God? You know, or, or going to church occasionally, that's, that's enough. Or giving what little extra money I have after expenses to the church, that's, that's enough. Or, you know, attending one small church-related group, well, that's enough. Well, I've been on enough church committees. In short, how many of us have thought or even said, I have done enough for the church. Let someone else do it now. Now, I'm not saying this is not understandable. I know this. It's very understandable. And I'm not saying that many of us uh, have given, that, that many of you have not given a lot to the church and to God. I know many of us have given a lot to God and the church. All I'm asking of us is to consider whether or not enough is enough or whether enough is never enough. If God is always willing to do more on our behalf, why aren't we always willing to do more on God's behalf? In our gospel reading for today, which we didn't read, uh, we have Jesus talking about how he must suffer and die and be lifted up on a cross on our behalf. Well, what if Jesus had said, <laughs> enough is enough? What if Jesus had said, I've given my life, you know, I, I, I've given my life to you through my preaching, through my teaching, and through my healing, and journeying with you, and being with you, and now I'm being asked to die for you, you bunch of sinners and ingrates? No! Enough is enough! Is that what Jesus did? Did Jesus say that? If he did, where would we be if he had done that? But of course we know he didn't say it. Instead, he said, enough is never enough, including giving my life to die a horrible death. Whoa. That's giving enough. Enough is never enough. In light of that reality, how much have we given to God in return? Have we given enough? Or do we have more to give? In this same gospel reading from John, Jesus says, those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So trans translating that into the idiom that we're using today, another way to say this would be the following. Those who say enough is enough will only receive enough. But those who say enough is never enough will receive more than enough, including eternal life. Yes, I too am like many of you who often wants to throw up my hands in response to God and the church and scream, enough is enough. But praise be to our God who never said that in response to us. Instead, God has always and will always forever say, enough is never enough. And so our response to God and the church should be the same. Enough is never enough. Enough of that. Amen. This is a good one. You guys will like this closing song. It's number 277, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. We'll be singing all three verses. Tell me the stories of Jesus I love to hear. 
things I would ask him to tell me if he were here. Saints by the wayside, tales of the sea, stories of Jesus, tell them to me. First let me hear how the children stood round his knee, and I shall fancy his blessing resting on me. Words full of kindness, deeds full of grace, all in the love light of Jesus' face. Into the city I'd follow the children's band, waving a branch of the palm tree high in my hand. One of his heralds, yes, I would sing, but it's Hosanna's Jesus is King. I see today we have another prayer shawl up here. Today's prayer shawl is for Dina Prince, who is Judy Puckett's friend. So I ask that you come up after the service, lay your hand on it, and lift up a prayer of hope and, and healing uh, for Dina Prince. As is our tradition now, we'd like to close with our visioning prayer, which I know we're all still trying to memorize. So it's up on the screen or in your bulletin. So uh, let us pray. Dear, Dear God, God, empower us to, to go, go into, into our, our community. community so, so we, we might connect, connect with, with your kingdom, kingdom in ways that encourage us to grow as, as disciples. disciples. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God gave everything for us. God gave his life. Because for God, enough was never enough. How much are we willing to give in return? Search your hearts and know that you have more to give and then give it to those who are in need in the love of in the name of our father son and holy spirit amen, amen.